Do you know how to pitch a stock in an interview? Today, we're going to show you how. So stick around to see how an MD from Citibank Equity Research would answer that question. If you're applying to equity research, investment banking, or just any market-based or buy-side-based roles, you should be prepared to pitch your interviewer a stock or two. Today, we have Craig Irvine. He was formerly a managing director in equity research at Citi, and he's going to show us how he'd answer some of the most common interview questions that was actually submitted to us on the Wall Street Oasis company database for Citibank equity research specifically. So watch as he answers some of these toughest interview questions, including how to pitch a stock. Hi, Craig. Welcome to the interview. All right. Thanks, Danny. Nice to meet you. Yeah. And thank you for taking the time because I know you're really busy, man. Um, so for the purpose of this, would you give our audience a quick introduction about your background and particularly in equity research? Okay, sure. I, I, I spent a number of years in equity research. I started out covering banks. Most of it was in Asia. My first job was actually in Hong Kong. Um, and I did that for a couple of years. And then I switched to cover telecoms for a number of years. Um, and then I was the head of research in for Asia for Daiwa Capital Markets for about three years. Um, I left that about 10 years ago and since then have been working mostly with private companies uh, and in other, in other different analytical type roles, effectively working for private um, credit underwriting and uh, family office, you know, PE type invest in investing. Um, so that I, and, and I, I came into equity research largely because towards the end of business school, I just figured out it was the, a great combination for me. Um, you know, I'm very analytical and very quantitative, but I also love sitting across the table talking to people. I like presenting ideas of different things, whether big ideas or small ideas, both. And I realized that that was actually a really good fit for me personally. So that's why, that's why I settled on that. Awesome. And we're actually going to go through a mock interview where I ask you some of these more common interview questions. And one of them is why equity research. So, um, you know, we're really privileged to have you do this mock interview because it's really, um, I think a lot of the students are interested to hear what someone from a senior level in equity research, um, how they would answer these questions. So let's get started. Are you ready? Yeah, already. Okay. So I'll play the role of the interviewer. And um, ideally, you know, our, a lot of our students are folks that are trying to break into equity research. And I know you have a lot of experience already. So if you could think back to, um, you know, for some of these questions where maybe you were in your earlier uh, years in equity research, fresh out of MBA, fresh out of undergrad, um, what would be the best way to answer these questions? That'd be really helpful. I'll do my best. All right. So let's start with the first question, which is a very common interview question. Why Citibank? Okay. Well, I chose Citibank largely because I had been an analyst for a number of years. I was well in the marketplace and there are two different banks that needed uh, a telecom analyst in Asia at the time. It was this was back this was back when telecom was a big hot sector and there was a lot of investment banking fees to be earned etc and it was quite important so I ended up largely with a choice between at the time J P Morgan and Citigroup I chose Citigroup largely because of its China based investment banking relationships at the time they had a relationship manager who was actually a niece of Zhao Ziyang the former vice premier of China. People for public, and you know, part of it came down to just realizing that I think I'd rather, you know, line up with them. And this is before the IPOs of China Telecom, before the IPOs of China Netcom or Unicom, and so it was a partly about you know I'm going to get the best possible access here uh, in a number of ways. So for me, it was a research job, but it was partly it was largely driven by who's going to have the better, who, who I guessed was going to have the better deal access over the next five years. Got it. And so uh, this is more of a, a tack on question to that, you know, for someone who is more junior breaking into equity research, how would they find, um, this is outside of the interview context, of course, but how would they find which, which firms had more access? You know, I know that's not something that's publicly available per se. Yeah, it, it's, um, the, the first thing you do is look for the league tables. Okay. And, but when you look at a league table, when you look at an investment banking league table, you really want to see who's the best. Never look at the table that said the first, look at the person who's second, especially, or I should say, if you're looking at pitches prepared by investment bankers, yeah. because every investment banker will try and doctor their lead table so they come out number one. They'll self define that by defining the universe and stretching it and cost slicing it. But you'll always find truth by looking at the number two. 
Um, but the league tables will tell you a lot about where certain sectors are important. Now, it's important to con to, to know that now that's probably not nearly as and it's, it's, it's valid because a lot of structures have been put in place to do a better job than we had been in the strip of separating research from investment banking. Yeah. Um, it's not to say that they're completely, you know, un, unrelated, but it, that's a, it's not quite as, as, as much of a straight line as it was back when I joined City. Got it. Thank you. I, I actually never thought of that. That makes perfect sense that they would doctor it to make sure that they end up on top. Um, yeah. So, yeah, thank you. Um, so the next question is, why equity research for you? What drew you to equity research? Okay. Well, I was in, I was, I was three quarters of the way through business school and really still didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, but I came across, you know, I had some number of contacts, made some friends, a classmate who had been in research before business school. And I realized that it was a function, the day-to-day -day operations of it were just a very good fit, something very, uh, that appealed to me a great deal. Um, I really like the game theory elements of research, and I don't mean game, game theory in a kind of classic move versus move standpoint, but in a, you know, this is a job about trying to forecast the future, and that's really, really hard. Um, and it's, and, and it's you know, picking stocks was, I hadn't really kind of grown up being a, a stock picker who read the Wall Street Journal all the time, but I kind of realized that it was also a function that relied heavily on in-depth expertise. And I've always been leaning towards, I, 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 especially at the time, I'd always been kind of one, always appealed to kind of getting more and more in-depth, really deep in the weeds of a particular industry, whatever you were. Because the very first conversation I ever had about research with the classmate of mine, I said, well, what was it like? He said, well, the first thing you do is you just get to know everything you can about your industry. Everything, everything. And I, I just thought, I like that idea. Um, so when I learned more about how we put together a financial model, we try to have to value the stocks and, and make recommendations, but most importantly, how much time you spend then pitching your ideas, you know, whether it's the three minute morning call pitch, whether it's a luncheon presentation, whether it's just, you know, a constant number of kind of one-on-one -on -one meetings with clients where you can have some incredibly sort of uplifting, but interesting, challenging, uplifting conversations with clients about what's going to happen in the future. And, and that's kind of what you're really doing. And I used to really love that. Excellent. Um, you spoke about having that in-depth knowledge about an industry. So I know you um, have an interest in telecom. Can you tell us about what is, what, what, um, where did that come from? And why do you have an interest in telecom? Um, well, I, I, I kind of developed the interest in telecom. It had more to do with the mentor and situation than it does strong underlying desire in telecom. Because so I started my career covering banks. Uh, I was working for, I was the bank analyst at Merrill Lynch um, in Hong Kong. They went through a merger um, to which the acquired, you know, the acquired entity had a better and more experienced, more established bank analyst than I am. And it's not a market that's big enough for two of us. And so I, I kind of, had an appropriate level of anxiety about that. But then I walked down to the boss and I said, you know what, I'll give up everything I've done on banks because I want to go to telecom and I'm going to go work for this guy. Because we had an absolute star analyst in telecom and I figured I'd rather go from banks in Hong Kong to telecom regionally. And this is this is the early stage of all the telecom privatization in Asia. And it's partly so, it was partly opportunistic, it was partly situational, but it was also partly, this is the guy I want to learn from because he's the best. Yeah. And now that you've been in the industry for over 20 years, is that right? I, yeah. I mean, <laughs> <I don't, laughs> not to date anyone here. Um, but now knowing what you know about telecom, I know you said in the beginning you started because of this this person that um, yeah. you wanted to follow. What have you found interesting about telecom now that you didn't know maybe when you started? Well, the, the, the two things that stand out are having learned about operating leverage. Um, and it's relationship, and actually three things, operating leverage is relationship to free cash flow, positive free cash flow. Um, and thirdly is kind of oligopolistic competition. Those are the things that really stand out for me in, in telecoms. And it, it took me years in going from, you know, my first wireless model I built when penetration was 2%. Used to have bitter arguments about whether it gets a 10, which now today seems completely absurd. Yeah. Um, but when I really learned a lot more about the nature of the operating leverage, so I'm a telecom network, I build out my network, a lot of pipes, a lot of towers, all the different elements of that. But then my marginal cost is almost. 
And therefore, that changes the dynamics of the business quite differently than if I were running a bakery, for example, where I, I consume yeast and flour to make my, my bread every day, whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, and that creates some diff- different dynamics in terms of both risk, but particularly in terms of the second thing I mentioned, which is free cash flow. Because um, in the earlier stages of my career, I'm in Asia, everything's based on growth, growth, growth. Nobody, nobody gave a damn about ROE. Nobody, nobody cared if the incremental dollar was ever going to be profitable. But we went through a massive transition a number of years ago where it did start to matter. I found that really interesting because I realized how if I build a telecom network and I have to spend to bring on customers, there's a point when I cross over to positive free cash flow. And that when that happens, I have massive de-risking of my business. I mean, it, it's massive. And that de-risking means that my multiples expand from... Uh, for the Korean wireless carriers, it was an expansion from, you know, three, four times EBITDA to seven, eight times EBITDA. Enormous opportunity for people to understand that. And then I also learned, realized how that the nature of recurring revenues in a telecom environment where there's no incremental cost of goods sold um, had a very special attraction. Um, and it applies to telecom, it applies to other, a lot of other infrastructure-like investments. Um, and those are those are by far the, the biggest the biggest element. There's some, some, like I said, there's some, that creates a natural tendency to some kind of reasonable size not like optimies, but that can make for great investing. Got it. All right, so we're going to move to the more technical side of the interview. Uh, um, can you pitch me a stock? Okay, good. So the stock I'm going to pitch you is that has nothing to do with telecom. Um, but it has, it creates some really interesting challenges and that's Tesla. So the, the ticker on it is obviously TSL current share price is about $178 a share. Um, it's down 35 or 40% from its peak, you know, about 10 months ago, last July time frame. And I find Tesla really interesting because I did it. If I, if I looked at the stock a year ago, I would, I would have only focused on one thing. And that is the fact that they're effectively the only game in town, a lot of new entrants coming, the existing automakers were all going to come up with electric vehicles. And they were just, there's no way they were going to hold on to much market share. Market share is going to come down. It's going to pull down their premium. They had a very strong first adopter type premium pricing. I said, that's all doomed. But that was before I really looked into the financials of Tesla. And when I did that um, later last year, I realized a number of things. It's got the highest margin in the industry among all the incumbents. Startups aren't supposed to be like that, not even remotely close. It had the highest, you know, net margin, um, EBITDA, mar- you know, operating margins of those, those of those players, and of course, a faster growth rate from the smaller base. Um, and I realized that that was largely because they you know, they had matured. They weren't really a startup anymore, even though I can remember what ten years ago, you know, they kind of almost almost died when they couldn't get the original roadster to take off. Um, and that's when I kind of realized that somewhere along the line of the efficiencies in manufacturing an electric vehicle, they had put enough capital into it that they were basically already the market leader in terms of operating efficiency and everything else. And that's just an enormous factor because for big industrial industries, one of the things you focus on the most is who's the low cost provider. And that, that supplies when you're making semiconductors or cars and almost anything. In the long run, the low cost provider almost always needs. They are now the low cost provider in that space, at least within the current tradable auto universe. We could get into a long discussion about what's going to happen when Chinese imports start coming to the US later this year. And that's going to be really interesting. So Tesla comes out and they are far better than all their competitors already, even though the startup is supposed to be behind and they're supposed to be burning cash. Tesla generates four billion dollars a year in cash right now, um, in, in in free cash flow, and that's that's money that's available to 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 reinvest in, to double down, if you will, on on their growth. Terms. So that's enough to kind of absorb a lot of market share, absorb a lot of loss of pricing power, uh, and still be leading the market. The real problem with Tesla then becomes valuation. So it's currently trading on a four P of about fifty, which you know there's a point even in my growth, my younger growth days. 50 would have been just like, there's no way you're going to buy a stock at 50 times. Um, however, when you think about the structural opportunity, about 1% of the world's vehicles right now are electric. 1%. And so, and it's pretty hard to argue that over 20 year period, that's going to go to 80 or 100. And 
Therefore, the market opportunity to them is so infinite that as long as they don't screw up on the execution, you know, they're very likely to be able to grow into that 50 times valuation. The other comparable is this look at something, a group of stocks that I sometimes refer to as a kind of uh, structural long-term growers, dominant growers. And the, the key the key example in that is actually Amazon. Amazon's been trading on 50 times earnings for 20 years. And so if you get over that that high PE on the valuation, uh, because you consider the long-term opportunity, the fact that they're already leading their their competitors in terms of their their, their cost position, um, it gets very easy to say, sure, they're going to trade 50 or 60 times for the next 20 years. And and that's that get frankly that helps get you over the valuation problem. You know, for, for Tesla, so you know, I'd, I'd be I'd be pretty comfortable buying them for that, right? And especially if it's off thirty five percent. You know, one thing I learned as a, as, a, as an equity analyst is, the, is that is you don't you you want to buy find the great long term buys when they are off by a third, because that's just that's just getting a better price. Excellent. So I'd be a buyer. I'd be a buyer at Tesla right now. I'm sold. <laughs> Thank you so much for that stock pitch. Um, we're going to wrap it up with one more question, which is more towards the market. So um, there's a lot of different opinions in the market right now with different thought leaders. What's your personal opinion on whether or not the Fed will experience a hard or soft landing? Well, it's it's um, I, I, I probably rephrase that to what the economy is going to figure a soft landing. I tend to, I'm a pretty mixed mind. I generally lean towards soft landing scenario. And that's because for, I've been expecting a recession for some time that hasn't happened. And the reasons that it hasn't happened might trace back to the kind of, I think the post, mostly the post COVID labor dynamics. So at least from my opinion, the single biggest link between uh, inflation, the, the single biggest driver of inflation tends to be a tight labor market. You know, globalization has meant that supply chains and all kinds of things have got, you can usually find something better to help stave off uh, the demand problem, but you can if you need to hire somebody. So that point when a business needs to hire, pay more to get their employees, to get their product done, but that's true, you're the dry cleaner on the corner or if you're GM. And so, but I think that the, so, so the, the strong jobs growth lately should say that we should be in the wings of a tighter labor market. And therefore, we should be saying we've got to keep raising interest rates to pay inflation. And if that's the case, we probably are heading towards a recession. Uh, however, I think that COVID has messed up those dynamics because it took so enough people left the labor force. So it's understated uh, true unemployment. People weren't counted in the in part of the labor force. And that a lot of the strong jobs growth in the last 12 or 18 months has been people has been skewed towards people who had left the work, the labor force re-entering the workforce they still got counted as a job created um but it does not reflect as much tightness in the labor market as you might have expected if i'm right about that then we probably really have found our way to a soft landing because it probably is not as much need to keep raising interest rate i do think that interest rates have probably plateaued um and since we haven't we haven't fallen into some section uh, it's probably leaning a little bit towards the soft landing scenario excellent well um I also want to give a time for you. If you have any other advice, um, tips, tricks for our candidates looking to land a role in equity research, we'd love it if you could share. Um, I, my tips would probably have more to do with executing well in that, in that role in equity research, but mostly starts with, you know, stocks are about stories and they're about uncertainty, all right? As much as we might like to look at the stock market. And, it, and, and I've told this to analysts that worked for me in the past. I said, never forget to respect the complexity of what we're doing and the uncertainty of it. I've had a lot of analysts say, oh, yeah, I'll do that. No, but that'd be easy. Nothing is really easy that we did. Um, if an analyst picks is a, has a record of kind of getting 60% of their stock picks right, they're probably an absolute rock star. It's that difficult to really do it well. And therefore, you know, success isn't necessarily based on um, getting your stock picks right. It's actually more about service um, to the to the clients. Because I had clients that were deep value investors. I had clients that were strong growth investors. Some that were super technical, some that were big picture. And you had to be able to adapt your story to them. So uh, it's a long way of saying, you know, be flexible and, res and, and respect the uncertainty that's kind of laid out in front of you. That picture, if you're in that role. Got it. Well, and, then, and this is where, be curious. 
that's I'd wrap that up. Just be curious. Yeah. Thank you so much, Craig. We really appreciate your time. Okay. Thanks a lot, Amy. Appreciate it.